Hey guys, what's up? Homecoming by Cynthia Voigt, Chapter 11, coming at ya. Check out my Storytime with Carrie playlist to check out the first preceding 10 chapters. Anyway, here we go. Something about Aunt Scylla's house, even though she knew it belonged to Cousin Eunice, Dicey still thought of it as Aunt Scylla's house and still regretted her lost dream of it, made Dicey's brain slow down. Maybe it was trying so hard to please Cousin Eunice that had that effect on her. Maybe it was the routine of every day, with meals, cleaning, times to drop off the little children and pick them up, shopping, mending, and ironing, having the cup of tea ready for Cousin Eunice at precisely 20 of 6. Maybe it was just fatigue after her long journey there. Or maybe it was that nothing seemed to happen, except the same thing happening over and over again. Even that was not precisely true. Sergeant Gordo called up one morning when Dicey was alone in the house. He asked her to come down to the police station and gave her careful instructions for getting there on the bus. She took enough change for her fare from shopping money and rode the bus down to the old stone building with bars on the windows instead of second and third stories. There she sat in the midst of a large busy room to look at some pictures of women who might be mama. None of them were. All of them, Sor Sergeant Gordo told her, were dead and unidentified. They had found the Tillerman's car, he told her and the pocket police could sell it and send the money to Dicey. He didn't expect she would get very much for it, he said. Does that mean Mom is not dead, Dicey said? Sorry, guys, I'm just flipping. Okay, to get to the end of the chapter. Um, I think we can assume that, Sergeant Gordo said. Now I'll start checking hospitals. Part of the problem is that we don't know where to look. If you'd reported her, mis reported her missing right away, we'd have a better chance. I'm sorry, Dicey said. Fat lot of good that does now, he answered. His phone rang then, and he waved her away. I'll be in touch if anything turns up. Dicey didn't have much time for thinking about her family. James, she knew, was perfectly happy. He studied at night and went through the heavy wooden doors into the school at a run every morning. Now and then he would report some amazing fact to Dicey. One time he told her about Alaric's treasure that disappeared long ago when Rome ruled the world and America wasn't even discovered. Nobody had ever found the treasure because Alaric hid it so well. He diverted a river, then buried the treasure in the riverbed, then rerouted the river back to its old path. The treasure was somewhere there in Italy. Only, only Alaric knew where. He had killed all the men who had worked to hide it, so they couldn't tell. James pored over the maps in his history book, trying to think out where the treasure might be. James was always willing to tell Dicey what he was learning, even though he seemed to have no interest in discussing other things with her. Sammy, on the other hand, demanded more and more of her attention. He ran up to her every afternoon, grabbed her hand, and pulled her away from the gate where she waited with Maybeth silent beside her. Let's go, he said. Let's play ball. Will you play catch with me? Can we race on the sidewalk? He wanted to wrestle with her after dinner and needed her to tuck him in every night. Maybeth was Maybeth. Silent and peaceful, she went off to church with Cousin Eunice on Sundays, dressed in a frilly pink, frilly pink dress Cousin Eunice had bought her, wearing a little straw hat with flowers on the brim and white gloves. She had even had a little white purse. Cousin Eunice had taken a great liking to Maybeth. Dicey wondered if she was losing touch with her family. Dicey had looked through Aunt Scylla's photograph albums. She didn't know what it was she was looking for, just something. There were only two pictures of Aunt Scylla's childhood, before she met and married Mr. Logan and lived in Bridgeport. The first picture was a posed photographer's picture, badly yellowed, of a man with a long beard and a woman with long hair piled on top of her head. The woman held a baby on her lap. Beside her stood a girl with curling blonde hair and a silly smile. Underneath this picture, Aunt Scylla had written in her lacy handwriting, Mother, Father, Abigail, and myself. Dacey thought that Abigail must be the baby, since Cousin Eunice and Aunt Scylla were 12 years older than her sister. It's... Okay, I think I read that right. <laughs> the other picture must have been taken at a birthday party, because there was a cake with candles at the center of the picture. A pretty young woman in a white summer dress held a knife to cut the cake. Beside her on one side stood her parents, the man's beard turning white and the woman grown fat. On the other side stood a girl with wildly curly dark hair and a sour expression. The three adults were looking at the photographer and smiling. The little girl scowled down at the cake. Her hands were behind her back. Dicey would have bet that her fists were clenched. Dicey recognized the oldest daughter as Aunt Scylla. The younger girl was Abigail, the sour one her grandmother. One afternoon, Dicey went early to meet James. She went early on purpose and entered the school building rather than going around to the playground to where James usually waited for her. She found Father Joseph in a small office sitting behind a wooden desk correcting papers. 
We're very pleased with James, he said to her. Sit down. He pulled out a chair. How is everything going for you? You've been with your cousin for about two weeks now, haven't you? Yes, Dicey said. Is something wrong, he asked her. Then he seemed to recall something that had slipped his mind. I've been wanting to talk with you anyway and haven't gotten around to it. I'm glad you came in. Shall we deal with your business first and then get on to mine? But you said you were pleased with James, Dicey said. She was alarmed. He's happy here, awfully happy. James is fine, fine, Father Joseph said. He closed up his grade book, folded his hands and looked at her. What brought you to see me? I wondered if you had heard from your church in Crisfield, Dicey said. Her mind was working furiously. Was something wrong about my Beth or Sammy or both of them? She knew something was wrong with Sammy at camp. She'd known that all along. What do you know about your mother's family, Father Joseph asked. Nothing. Mama never talked about them, never at all, except Aunt Scylla. And that wasn't the truth, but Mama didn't know that. I found a picture of my grandmother in Aunt Scylla's albums, but she was only a girl, my Beth's age. Cousin Eunice doesn't know anything. Did you find out something? A little. The family's not Catholic, you know. Dicey nodded. He kept bringing that up. So they aren't parishioners. If they were parishioners, then we would know a great deal about them. But your grandmother, her name is Abigail Tillerman. I knew that. There were names under one of the pictures. She lives alone on a small farm outside of Crisfield. She lives absolutely alone there. Her husband died some years ago, so Dicey didn't have a grandfather. They weren't Catholics, but Crisfield is a small town where everybody knows everybody else. So the priest asked some questions of his older parishioners. They had known the Tillemans. None of them had been friends. The Tillemans didn't seem to have any friends, but they knew about them. He told me there were three children in the family. A boy, John, named after his father. People say he is in California. Nobody has heard from him for years. Not his mother, nobody. Twenty years or more. A second son died in Vietnam. Do you know about the war in Vietnam? Dicey nodded. Well, she had heard of it, and James would be able to tell her about it. Then the daughter, your mother. She ran off when she was 21, they say, to join a, to join a, merchant, mar a, jo a merchant mariner she had somehow met, a man named Francis Verker. My father? The man had swung... His her to the man who had swung her to his shoulder and named her his little only father joseph rubbed his eye, hand over his eyes yes at least that is the name on the birth certificates from provincetown i have no reason to think he was not everyone's father the police are trying to trace him for me they had searched for him for some years now he seems to have disappeared i don't mind dicey said i do father joseph's voice was sharp and angry that surprised dicey and sensing his concern she was grateful to him for the first time in all the time in Bridgeport. Truly grateful. Do you mind being told unpleasant truths, Dicey? Yes, but I'd rather know the truth than not, if that's what you mean. I thought so. The Tillerman home, it must have been unhappy. Do you know what that can mean? I think so, Dicey said. I mean, we were happy. We were, whether you believe it or not. Oddly enough, I do believe it. Dicey smiled at him. You see, they were kids at school. They hated their parents, or they hated other people so much that, you knew it wasn't just being angry. It was hating. I can't explain what I mean, but I could feel the unhappiness. I see that James doesn't have all the brains in the family, Father Joseph said. Dicey was flattered. <clears throat> He's the smart one. I'm just practical. Well, the Tillman seemed to have had that kind of unhappiness. The priest, or his informants, seemed to blame her parents, especially the father, Remember, this is just conjecture, not fact. It may just be gossip, you know. This is just what someone told him and he told me. Your grandfather seems to have been a stern man, an unbending man, overrighteous, perhaps. Perhaps cruel. Nobody knows anything certain. Your grandmother always let him have his way. Nobody can say what she thought. She never spoke of it. He had his boys do a man's work from the time they were eight. He used a whip for disobedience, a real whip. He did not tolerate disobedience of any sort. He quarreled with his neighbors. He was angry, probably hate-filled too. She, your grandmother, was apparently the kind of woman who sticks faithfully to her husband's rule. She may have thought he was right, or something else. It doesn't really matter which, does it? In effect, no. You are practical. I haven't had much choice. Speaking practically, then, your other uncle is dead. Your mother has disappeared. And I don't think your Uncle John wants to be found, which leaves your cousin Eunice. What was wrong with her grandmother? Dicey didn't ask aloud. She sat for a while. 
what a family, she finally said. You shouldn't judge unless you've been there and known what actually went on, Father Joseph said. Come on, Dicey protested. And Mama's, but she gave us a good home in Provincetown. She took good care of us, as good as she could. Yes, I think so, in some ways. One wonders, he said carefully, his light brown eyes resting on Dicey's face, if there isn't a strain of mental weakness. Was he reading her mind? Your grandmother's isolation. She has no phone, so the priest drove out from Crisfield to talk with her. She wouldn't let him into the house. She apparently screamed aloud so that he wouldn't hear what, she wouldn't hear what he was saying. Dicey remembered Mama's strangeness and James' idea that craziness was inherited. I mention this to you because I want to tell you that, if it can be inherited, you have probably not inherited it, in my opinion, Father Joseph said. Are you sure? No, of course not. But remember, you've already been through more trials than most people endure in a lifetime. You and James, you two at least, seem to have the strength and resilience to go on. Isn't that what sanity is? I don't know, Dicey said. She rose to go, her mind filled with what he had said. But we are concerned about your sister. She is so far behind her age group. She doesn't speak. She can't read or work with numbers. This again. She can, Dicey sat down again. She can do all that. She isn't, she doesn't in front of strangers. Her teachers always said she couldn't do things, but at home with me or James, she could. You don't believe me. No, I don't. You didn't believe me about our father being the same, Dicey reminded him. That's true. You just have to give Maybeth time. How much time? There's Sammy, too. The brothers report that he is not mixing in well. He is hostile to his peers and hard to direct and control. He plays alone because the other boys avoid him. James sighed. Uh, Dicey sighed. It was hardest on Sammy when Mama left us, and before, it was hardest because she paid so much attention to him. James told me on our way here that in Provincetown, Sammy had it hardest of anyone because of coming after Maybeth and the things people said about Mama. How did you and James manage, Father asked. Father Joseph asked. James is smart. He'd think his own thoughts and ignore people. I guess I just fought back too hard for people to want to tease me. But Sammy wouldn't. I mean, he'd fight, but he's not as fierce as I am. Father Joseph smiled. When he was a baby, he was always happy and friendly. Sometimes, oh, that's the way he really is. He can still be that way. Sometimes on the way here, you could see it. You could see him getting to be more like himself. Sammy is a difficult child, Father Joseph said, but I suppose his hostility isn't surprising when you think of causes. He needs a warm, loving home. So do we all, Dicey thought. She looked quickly at Father Joseph. I love Sammy, she said. Of course you do. You must consider, however, the effect of these burdens on your own life. I think you must. I think you must give some thought to adoption and foster homes. Sammy, despite his behavior, may prove the easiest to find a home for. It will be hard to place Maybeth, a retarded child. She's not! She has the symptoms, Father Joseph answered gently. And you, an older child, you would also be hard to place. Your cousin, I don't know what her plans are now. Dacey had no idea what he was talking about. She shrugged her shoulders. James also is old for adoption, but he would easily find a permanent home here at the school, or he might stay with one of our families. His academic promise makes him most desirable. Dicey could think of nothing to say. You should think of these things, Father said, still gently. I know you don't want to, but you must think them through and be ready. Think of yourself also. You are still a child yourself. A child? Dicey felt a hundred years old or more. I'm not asking you to decide, just to open your mind to other possibilities. Dicey nodded. She knew she should thank him, but she couldn't, so she just walked out of the room without a word. That afternoon in the mail, Dicey received a check from the police department of Prockett for $57. The, the receipt with it said profits from the sale of one 1963 Chevrolet sedan less costs. Dicey looked at the check and smiled for the first time in days it felt. She could give it to Cousin Eunice and that would make her cousin feel better about taking the Tillermans in. Or she could buy some blue jeans for herself and Maybeth, which would make them feel better. Or she could hide the money away, for what purpose she didn't know. Dicey knew what she should do. She should give the money to Cousin Eunice. Instead, she cashed the check at the grocery store where the man knew her and put the money into the box as Maybeth's church shoes had come in. Having money made a difference. It woke Dicey up. She began to think of how she could earn more during the day when everybody was gone. 
She could easily spend less time on housework if she pushed herself to be faster and more efficient. If she did that, she could have some time for earning. Dicey felt like her old self again. Because she was young, Dicey couldn't get a regular job. Over the next few days, she thought hard about what she could do to earn money. She could wash windows. She knew how. She'd done it. She decided to try that. If that didn't work, she would try something else. First place Dicey asked for work was the grocery store. The manager owner, Mr. Platernus, liked her, so she figured she'd try him first. Dicey suggested to Mr. Platernus that she wash his windows three times a week for two dollars each time. He studied her. I've only got two windows, he said. They're plate glass and big. I'd do them inside and out, and then I'd restack the cans, goods, and dog food, Dicey countered. You need some special equipment, he said. A long-handled washer, a bucket, cleanser? If I knew I'd be using them, I'd buy them, Dicey said. He considered this. Dicey enjoyed the bargaining. He enjoyed it, too. I'd buy them here, Dicey added. I'd buy all my supplies here, too. You going into the business? I might be. He thought some more. Two dollars is a lot of money. A store with clean windows is more attractive to customers, especially a grocery store. More people would come to shop here. I can do the windows myself. Three times a week, they get pretty dirty. I know, oh, I know. How about a trial period of a week? Two weeks, Stacy said. It'll cost me that much to get the equipment. He laughed at her. All right, two weeks. And I'll call some other people who might be interested, some other store owners in this area. We'll see if they would like to employ your services. Would you, Mr. Platernus? You won't be sorry, Dicey grinned at him. By bargaining this way, before she knew it, Dicey had six regular jobs washing the city grime off the windows of neighborhood stores. She had two grocery stores, one hardware store, one shoe store, one pawn shop, and one dress store. The dress store was her best job. They had four big windows they wanted washed three times a week, so she earned $12 a week from there. That added to the $6 weekly from Mr. Platernus and four piece from the other three stores made a total income of $30 a week. Her supplies, when she had made the original purchase of bucket and long-handled squeegee, cost her $5 a week. Mr. Platernus let her store her equipment in the closet with his own cleaning equipment and supplies just to keep an eye on her, he said. He didn't need to worry. Dicey liked her work. She liked making money. The money in the shoebox began to mount up, and Dicey's spirits mounted with it. She was working hard, but she seemed to have more energy than before. The July heat thickened and deepened, but Dicey wasn't slowed down by that. Mr. Platernus couldn't get over her high spirits. You must have been raised in the tropics, he said, mopping at his face with a cloth ha handkerchief. He often stood outside and talked with Dicey while she worked. He would help her replace the soup cans and bags of dog food she had to move before she could wash the inside windows. I like having something to do, Dicey said. I think you'd have enough to do keeping house for Miss Eunice, or Miss Logan and your family. Since you arrived here, I haven't seen her except passing by. You're doing all her shopping and the rest of it, too, I'm guessing. That's not the same, Dicey said. You don't like housework, Mr. Platernus continued. Dicey didn't contradict him, though she knew that wasn't it. She didn't mind housework. She'd always kept house in Provincetown, although Mama wasn't nearly as fussy as, Aunt, as Cousin Eunice. But it was, wasn't the same when you always had to remember to feel grateful. Dicey bought herself three maps, one of Connecticut, one of New York, and, Jersey, and New Jersey, and one of Maryland and Delaware. She found Crisfield easily enough, way down at the end of Maryland, facing the Chesapeake Bay. One night at dinner, Dicey tried to find out something about her grandmother. Did you ever visit your mother's family, she asked. Cousin Eunice looked up in surprise. Of course not. Mother said she didn't want to go back, and she wouldn't have me going near the place. Sammy, what are you doing? Sit up. Don't lie on the table. Bring the fork to your face, not your face to the fork. Her eyes, sulking behind the glasses, went back to Dicey. I don't know why you children can't work on your manners yourselves instead of worrying me with them. Don't you think I have enough to do? Dicey cast a quick eye around the table. Maybeth put her left hand into her lap and straightened her back. Then she met Dicey's glance with a silly smile, half worried, half apologetic. I have enough to do, Cousin Eunice went on, and added to... She hesitated and seemed to remember something. Sammy, is that a cut on your hand? Sammy chewed and nodded. How did that happen? Cousin Eunice asked. Sammy stuck his jaw out. He did not answer. Answer me, Cousin Eunice said. I don't remember, Sammy muttered. That is a lie. How do you know? I know because I heard about how you got cut. That's how I know. 
Then why did you ask me? Sammy demanded. Maybeth bowed her head lower over her plate. Daisy looked at Sammy, trying to will him to be cooperative, or at least quiet. Cousin Eunice spoke through stiff lips. Don't be fresh. Don't you ever be fresh with me, you hear? The reason I asked you is because, because, because I wanted to hear what you would say, she finished lamely. I didn't say nothing, Sammy said. What was the fight about? Cousin Eunice asked. Nothing, Sammy said. Sammy, Dicey interrupted, Cousin Eunice wants to hear your side. I can't remember what it was about, Sammy said stubbornly. Dicey could have picked him up and shaken him. Who won? James asked. James, cried Cousin Eunice. Sammy lifted his head. Me. I did. That has nothing to do with it, Cousin Eunice said. Yes, it does, Dicey said to herself. It does to Sammy. I don't want to fight with you anymore, Cousin Eunice announced. And I don't want you to fight anymore. I want you to promise me that you won't. Sammy chewed silently. He kept his eyes on his plate. At least, Dicey thought, his mouth was closed. Sammy, Cousin Eunice warned him. He shook his head. Then you will go to your room right now. Cousin Eunice's voice sounded angry and tired. And you will stay there for the rest of the night. You tell lies. You won't promise not to fight. I won't have you at my table. Sammy got down from his chair and trudged out of the room. They heard his slow footsteps going up the uncarpeted stairs. They heard the door slam behind him. I don't know. I just don't know, Cousin Eunice said. She shook her head and the sausage curls on it bounced. At least I hear some fine things about James. James seems to be making quite a good impression. She smiled at him. James wavered between saying something rude and being flattered. Dicey watched him nervously. James is smart, she said, trying to tip the scales. It's not only that, Cousin Eunice said. James conducts himself well, too. He is a credit. It's a good school, James finally said. Dicey let out all her breath. James looked across at her, waggled his eyebrows the way Wendy had, and kept on talking. When you think of all there is to learn in order to understand things, like history and science, there's so much to learn. The fathers say that part of man's purpose to it is to increase his knowledge so that he can understand better how great is God's work. A lot of people think knowledge is dangerous, but they're wrong. Did you ever think that, Cousin, cousin Eunice? Yes, of course, Cousin Eunice said. God wants children to study hard and behave well in school. James answered slowly. I guess you could say that, but that's not the way the fathers talk about it, about learning. They don't treat it like a duty. They treat it like a gift, like grace. I don't think you can be right about that, Cousin Eunice said. Not grace. That's not what the Gospels say, is it? Nobody's ever told me the Gospels say that. I've always understood that duty is the most important, even the best. James shrugged. Maybe learning's just that way for me. Lucky for me, isn't it? Cousin Eunice smiled at him. The tension was gone from the table, but Sammy hadn't had much dinner, and he was up in his room. Dicey tried not to think about that. It was his own fault, anyway, for being so stubborn. But Dicey had never talked about her fights when she got home. You just didn't do that. That was squealing. Mama never asked about them. Why did Cousin Eunice have to ask? After the dishes were done and Sammy was asleep and Maybeth was tucked into her bed and James was settled down to do homework in the living room, Cousin Eunice called to Dicey to join her in the kitchen. Dicey saw that a cup of tea had been made for her and for some reason that made her nervous. Sit down, Dicey, Cousin Eunice greeted her. She was wearing another one of her black dresses. Dicey had never seen her wearing colors. Her eyes looked out at Dicey from behind polished glass. I was talking with Father Joseph today. I didn't know that, Dicey said. She wondered what was wrong now. He took me to lunch, Cousin Eunice said. Well, I was surprised when he asked me. I wasn't sure it was right, but he insisted that it was. We didn't go to a real restaurant, but it was a very nice cafeteria. Everything as clean as you could want. I had a fruit salad. There's something I haven't ever told you, you see, and Father Joseph thinks I should. What is that? Dicey asked. Before you came, you and your family, I had certain ambitions, Cousin Eunice said. Her voice was very soft, and she stirred her tea thoughtfully. Father Joseph knows of these, of course. He approved of them with certain reservations, and since he had approved, I was sure it was the right thing. What was? To enter a sisterhood, to become a nun. I was going to be a nun before, and Father Joseph had made the preliminary arrangements for me. It's a useful life. I have a substantial savings account, which would make up my dowry, that and the house, 
So you see, I could have managed well. It sounds, Dicey tried to think of what she should say. Nice, you'd make a good nun. Do you think so? I had hoped so. However, that is out of the question now. Cousin Eunice's eyes filled with tears, and she shook her head. Because of you children, you need me more, Father Joseph says. It is God's work, just as much, caring for the abandoned children. As she spoke, she looked over Dicey's shoulder at something Dicey couldn't see, something Dicey suspected wasn't there at all, and her eyes shone. That is my duty. You will be my family now. Her soft voice vibrated with the pleasure of resolution and sacrifice. Are you sure? Dicey asked. It is God's will, Cousin Eunice said, bowing her head. Dicey sipped tea, which she had never liked, and thought about this. That's awfully kind of you. Cousin Eunice smiled at Dicey. You're giving up something you want, Dicey said. You are not to speak of that, Cousin Eunice said. I wasn't going to tell you at all, but Father Joseph said that you and I especially must understand one another, so that if sometimes I grow sad, you will know why and sympathize with me rather than feeling that you've done something wrong. Perhaps May Beth is meant to be a nun. Perhaps she has a vocation and it will be my place to guide her to it. Perhaps she will be my purpose in life. Dicey wanted to get up and run, but she made herself sit still. Father Joseph suggested that I adopt you so that I will be the legal guardian. What if Mama comes back? Surely she has shown herself unfit to raise children, Cousin Eunice answered, her lips pursed. Dicey couldn't answer that. However, Dicey, you and I must deal with Sammy. He's causing some trouble at camp. Not just today, constantly. Father Joseph said he had spoken to you about this. Sammy has to be brought into line. I couldn't adopt a child who will bring nothing but trouble, could I? You saw how he behaved at supper. Sammy has to understand that his behavior is unacceptable. But, Dicey said and then changed her mind, how would you do that? I'll talk with Father Joseph. He's not sure that my house is the best place for Sammy, but he feels we should try it for a while to see if we can keep your family together. He's concerned about Maybeth, too, he told me, but I could assure him that we would do well, Maybeth and I. But Sammy, I don't know. I'll see. Father Joseph knows about disciplining boys. James, fortunately, is biddable. Sammy has to be brought into line so he doesn't shame me. Dicey stayed absolutely still. She didn't even blink. She didn't trust herself to speak. I do feel better now that we've talked, don't you? Cousin Eunice looked happy. Her curls bounced on her head. You will be like a family of my own. If I'd had a daughter, she might be just your age. You'll grow up and have children of your own so that when I'm older, I won't be alone. Just as mother wasn't alone. In a way, I'm glad about this, aren't you? And you children will have a good mother. We already have a good mother, Dicey said angrily to herself. Hold on, she said to herself. This was what Father Joseph had decided. It might be for the best. The Tillermans would be able to stay together, maybe. They would have a home. Daisy knew she should feel grateful to Cousin Eunice, but she didn't. She felt like crying. Thanks for listening, guys. Chapter 12, and then we begin a new saga for the Tillermans. Look how far we are, like halfway through now. It's pretty exciting. I hope you're still enjoying. Please give a thumbs up if you are and feel free to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and click that bell icon so you never miss an upload. I will be back soon with more stuff. Have a great day, guys. Bye.